Hey everybody, this is Colin G. Murphy and welcome to Colin Podcasting about Real Estate Show 35. My guest today is Alicia Jarrett. She is an expert in US land investing and she's based in Australia. She's got a terrific story to share. I think she's an inspiration to any investor who's been struggling to take the plunge, worried about not making things work, uh, worried about if, if they can do it, if they're too far away to do it, if they have the time to do it. You know, she's built a serious US real estate business from literally the other side of the world. Um, we had a great discussion, uh, started off talking about her early deals in the difficult Australian fix and flip market, uh, talked about the expensive real estate courses she took to learn about investing in, in the USA, uh, just her, her general commitment herself and her business partner, Matt, her commitment to make it happen and put those expensive courses to work. Uh, we go through her early successes and mistakes uh, flipping regular houses, low income houses in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, and how they transitioned full time into land flipping after that and built a very sophisticated marketing machine uh, and just an incredible semi automated business and, and just a terrific blend of traditional mail with technology and marketing and, and their kind of operating system was was generally so good that they created a way for other competitors to, to pay them for access to it. And, and now that's a, a significant business in itself. And uh, go through all that and, and a lot more. And uh, I think you'll enjoy it. Something different. And, and my second Australian guest on the show after Reed Goosen's in show number six. So, yeah, before we head on over to Alicia, just a quick reminder to, you know, to share these episodes on your social media. If you like doing that, you'll find me on either Colin G. Murphy or Colin Investments. Uh, my website is colininvestments.com. I'm always welcome new visitors there. There's a lot of reports and other free information that you can access very easily. And just give the show a rating or a review if, if you're enjoying it. Okay. And uh, yeah, let's, let's head on over to Alicia. It's a really good conversation. I think you're going to enjoy it. Alicia, Jared, how are you? Welcome to the show. Colin, I'm really great. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm really excited. It's my pleasure, and and I have the honor of interviewing another Australian. Reed Goosens had the was the first on the show, I think, back in show six. That was an awesome show. But you're I'm speaking to you from Melbourne, I think. So tell us a bit yes. about yourself. Yeah, so you are right. We are based in Melbourne, Australia, but we do business in the states. We absolutely love uh, doing business in the US. So my partner Matt and I have both got very different backgrounds. Where. He has a background in technology, transition, transformation, and I've got a background in human resources, uh, training, consulting, things like that. But Mm -hmm. um, we started to get into real estate into the States about four years ago when we did a few fix and flips. That was the time when television shows, whenever you turn on the TV, somebody was doing a fix and flip and a before and an after. We thought, that just looks exciting. We can get into that. Um, and because we both have done real estate in Australia for, you know, over 15, 20 years, we've done a number of properties here, we thought mm-hmm. that could be exactly the same. We'll just do that in the States, no problems. So wow. we started doing a few fix and flips and went over to the States and got our business up and running and um, bought a few houses and fixed them up and put a team in place. And that's great. Um, but I guess, Colin, you know, you've done fix and flips. You know how awesome they can be, but you also know how stressful they can be. <laughs> I do. I do. So we we had some really fantastic results with our fix and flips, but then the last one kind of broke us and, uh, and we thought, hmm, and that was also at about the time that it was getting really super competitive to find a really good off-market fix and flip, make the appropriate changes to, to get your right profit. And we thought... Maybe it's time to look at a different asset class. So we then got into land and uh, and doing a whole bunch of things with land investing. And that's, you know, wow. three and a half years later, here we are with um, uh, a really successful land investing business and, and some offshoots of that with uh, with some of the, the stuff that Matt's been doing with technology, which I'll tell you uh, later. There's so much stuff I want to get dig into there that there's a lot of stuff in that in that two minute segment but let's rewind a bit to where you were when you were working in Australia so what kind of real estate were you doing in Australia before you transitioned into the US? Yeah so we'd had uh, we'd had a couple of rental properties here um, Uh and having rental properties in Australia there's a, a taxation strategy that a lot of people use here called negative gearing which is not really um, all that common over in the states where mm-hmm. you have a property the rent for that property is less than what it costs to 
pay off that property, but the mm-hmm. difference in what you pay in interest, you actually offset against your taxes. So we were both in in very great jobs and um, and yep. earning really good money and needed to look at ways to you know minimize taxes. So we mm-hmm. had some investment uh, rental properties. We also did um, a couple of houses where we did the fix and flip over here as well. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, and there's really, I mean, I guess you know a lot of people go, why are you in the states doing real estate? It's really because it's quite limited here in Australia as to what you can do. Um, just due to the cost of real estate and the the price point as to where you get into the market and how you can make money, but also in relation to um, information. So here in Australia, as you're probably familiar where you're from in Europe as well, um, it's it's very limited as to what you can find out about a property property owner, the property Mm. attributes, and being able to market and do a whole range of things with both the property and the owner. Here, all on lockdown, you can pretty much not find out much uh, at all, which limits what you can do. So that's why we needed to start to look abroad with uh, different strategies. So you're right. And I haven't thought about that for a while, but there's no equivalent of, of Zillow in, in Ireland, for example, or Spain. Uh, I mean, there's something in it like it in the UK, but it's very limited. Whereas here in the US, I can say my next door neighbor, what, what did they, how much did they pay for their house? Where did they get their mortgage? What was their mortgage amount? Are they late on their taxes? Have they has somebody tried to sue them? Have they got a recently married or divorced or going through probate? I mean, you can find yeah. out all sorts of anything. Stuff that, <laughs> but the privacy laws in in Europe and in Australia are much much stricter, which is obviously good for some ways. But in terms of being a real estate investor looking to find motivated sellers, uh, not so much. And and you're even just other stuff. I mean, US is much more dynamic in terms of fix and flippers access to capital is much easier here. All of uh, that, lots yeah. lots of RIAs. I mean, there's so much going on where regular folks can set up pretty successful businesses. And I think you have to be a bit of a genius to become very successful flipping houses in the UK or Ireland or Australia or you know a lot of other countries. Whereas, um, certainly for me in Florida, you, you, I mean, I'm no genius or anything like that, but I've seen lots of people can build a big fix and flip business. So I guess... Yeah, but why, why, why the US stuff? For you, I mean, you're very far away. I can see why an Australian could buy a few turnkey rentals, but um, I'm impressed that you decided to just say, no, no, I'm skipping that. I'm just going to start investing. So how did that start? <laughs> yeah. So it started when um, I actually went along to a, a seminar that was, um, it's basically what they call a National Achievers Congress, and uh, and here in Australia they put it on once a year pre-COVID. And you have some fantastic speakers from all around the world. So at this particular mm. one, Tony Robbins was one of the speakers. Um, uh, Russell, uh, not Russell, Richard Branson. That's the name oh, I was okay. going for. In my brain, I had Russell Brand, but they're two totally different people. Different guy. <laughs> yeah. Richard Branson and Tony uh, Robbins. That's yeah. pretty high caliber piece speakers there. Yeah, so so we had those type of speakers that were headlining and it goes for three days. And then there was some other speakers from all around the world that just had different business uh, models that they were opening their books and sharing what it is that they did. Mm -hmm. And I was listening to a few people that were doing um, business over in the States and doing real estate and, uh, and something just got me up off my feet and went to the back of the room and signed up for a course, as you do. So where it started is my partner Matt and I went along to like a, a four-day course on how to do real estate in the States from Australia and how to set things up and do all the basics. And okay. um, and then then we got the upsell to go and do the other program and we did. And, uh-huh. you know, you see a lot of people out there that invest a lot of money into the, the learning side of how to do this business. So yes. we invested pretty heavily both in time and money to learn things. Uh-huh. But then it was just a case of, putting it into practice and I remember at the um at the the end of the first event that we went to the 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 guy that was training up the front of the room they'd all flown in from the states and he said you know I'm one of these people that sits up the front of the room Colin as well I like to be able to eyeball people and Mm -hmm. um, take lots of notes and you know be in there so we're sitting up the front of the room and he, he looked at everybody in this room there was probably about 60 people there and he said you know I've loved training over these few days but I can guarantee that there'll probably only be about two or four of you in this room that will ever do anything with this. And my heart kind of sank. And afterwards, Matt and I looked at each other and we said, let's not be one of the people that doesn't do anything. 
You know, mm. let's be the ones that do, no matter what it takes, let's give this a go. And so we started. We just kept putting one foot in front of the other and and as much as that threw up some challenges, we thought, you know what, this is an awesome opportunity. It's now or never. And we are the type of um, couple that don't like to live a life of regret. So, you know, we'd hate to look back in a few years' time and think, I wish we had have done that. Um, so we just started. And that's as, as easy as it got, Colin, is just started. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big fan of that. And far more people regret not doing things than doing things. And I'm I'm a big advocate of that. And it's very yeah. rare you regret doing something. So where, where did you start and, and what early successes and failures do you remember from your, your first yeah, US investing? Yeah, so... I guess to talk about getting started, you know, I see a lot of people out there um, that go and do a whole bunch of training and they just don't start. Yeah. So where we started, um, because it can get really overwhelming to begin with, you know, you go along to these training courses and I know you you help people in this way as well. And, and it just becomes this overwhelm of information, but also steps to take. So we just thought, you know, where we start is, First of all, let's find our courage because it does take courage to go out and do something vastly different to what everybody in your network is doing because you have a lot of people turn around to you at that time and go, are you crazy? What are you doing? (laughs) Um, So where we started was finding that courage and just putting one foot in front of the other. We also have a bit of an ethos, if you like, in our little team, Um, our big team now because our team is now, you know, more than 10 people uh, collectively for all of our businesses. Um, where we say done is better than not done. So we would rather do something and not have it go perfect than not do it and be sitting there still, you know, twiddling our thumbs. So mm-hmm. done is better than not done is, is also where we started. And um, and we also started by reaching out and building some networks. So interestingly enough, one of the people on our team four years later is a realtor that at the course, we literally picked up the phone to a realtor in Florida and said, we're new to real estate investing, but can we like partner up with you and look at some deals? And he's still on our team four years later. So we built a great relationship with him. His name's Michael and he's he's like family to us now. Um, and then we just got started with, you know, putting one foot in front of the other and taking that first phone call, closing mm-hmm. that first deal. And not, I think the thing, Colin, is not getting too far ahead of ourselves. I see a lot of people in this industry that, are trying to think when they're starting a hundred steps ahead, but really they just need to focus on the next five steps, get those done. And then when the next thing comes, tackle that, handle that. So yep. to come back to your question, what were some of our successes and failures early on? I guess some of our successes early on was the fix and flips. Um, we did really well, and I'm really proud of some of the houses that we oh, were. Were able they? To. Were they here in Florida? What, what kind of stuff? They was were. That <laughs> they were in Jacksonville. Okay. Um, we did. A, a, we actually went into some areas that uh, most people probably wouldn't want to go into. We had, <laughs> at the heart of it, we actually really wanted to look at affordable housing. You know, we, we see a lot when we go to the states of, um, I guess, you know, different socioeconomic levels and making sure that, that people have a roof over their head. It's something we're really passionate about. So we actually went into some areas and bought some pretty derelict drug addled houses that were wow. pretty awful mm-hmm. um, and uh, and put a team in place and got them to the point that we got some families in there that were decent, hardworking Americans that, you know, just needed a roof over their head and needed a chance. One of them was actually a triplex that we ended okay. up putting. Um, it was a very old house that had been separated into three areas mm-hmm. and we ended up putting, you know, three little families in there, which was great. Um, so we did quite a few of those and then... Our last one, interestingly enough, this is probably another lesson here. We changed our strategy on the last one, Colin. Okay. We went for a pretty expensive house in a really nice area. Okay. And put a lot of money and hard work into making that house better. Pretty much broke even. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I've done that too. Yeah. So the lesson for us in that was, you know, when you're sticking, when you've got a strategy and that strategy is working, you know, being in the affordable housing space and picking up houses for, you know, 10 to 20, 30,000, fixing them up and putting them back on the market for 50 to 60 to 70,000. Okay. We were doing really, really well at going into the houses that were two to 300,000, um, didn't go so good. And, and I think the lesson for us there is, don't change your strategy just because something looks really wonderful. Um, mm. Stick to your strategy if it's working. So we did the fix and flips. 
Uh, during that, I think we were able to really build a very strong network with, you know, our title companies, um, yeah. private money lenders. You know, you mentioned before about lending in the States, um, attorneys, realtors, contractors. So we built a really strong team. Um, and, uh, you know, that was a, a great business. So getting to that first five-figure profit early was really fantastic, not just only in the fix and flips, but also in land. Because I think it's when you get to that stage where a five-figure profit starts to come through that you're like, oh, this is proper, working. Yeah, it's a proper <laughs> company. And what were you doing? Exactly. Were you doing like a, a deal every month or, or you know, what, what did you scale up to before you pivoted to land? Yeah, we, we, only, um, we only did, uh, oh, what was the end? I think it was only about five or six before we went, let's go to land. And to gotcha. be honest, we probably would have kept going with fix and flips if that last one hadn't mm-hmm. had uh, been so stressful and, and, you know, caused so many problems. Um, yeah. And so, um, but I guess that that was the turning point, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm glad that there's always these silver linings. I'm actually really glad that that last one didn't work out mm-hmm. because switching over to land has been much less stressful, much easier to build a, a business and systems and processes around and much less competitive than trying to go out and find off-market um properties like houses and just so design them but fix them up i mean it's i i mean i remember even myself and my old business partner david we were you know based in florida and we bought a few houses up in charlotte like you say these nice four hundred thousand dollar houses and we ended up you know spending three hundred ninety thousand dollars to make 400 and you know losing half our hair <laughs> and it's just it so is. hard <laughs> and so stressful i mean and you say we got used to doing a, a, you know, with a conveyor belt of, of you know, $120,000 houses that we were doing as many as we could handle. And you can scale up crews and all sorts of stuff and they're on your doorstep. But to be honest, I, I didn't even realize until very recently that buying and selling land was even a thing for yeah. small, you know, kind of small to medium sized businesses. So what, and give us a quick intro. What, what, what does that look like? Yeah, and it, it's really exciting. And, and I think the thing that excites us the most about land is that no one's making any more of it. So land can be recycled a number of times. You know, we have a number of properties that we're selling now that have been used over the years for different things, but now it's vacant again and, and you can use it for other purposes. And uh, and the thing with land is you don't need a contract team in place to go in and fix it up. You get the land under contract for people that need help to get rid of it. So we're genuinely helping people who are like, I'm stuck with this piece of land. I'm paying taxes on it. I live in another state. You know, I inherited it. I've got no plans for it. Or I bought this piece of land in this beautiful new estate and we wanted to build on it, but our plans have changed. You know, now I'm stuck with it and I can't get rid of it. So there's a whole bunch of reasons why people get stuck with land. So we genuinely help them out because selling it to a realtor, it sits on the market for a long time and and then they've got to pay their commission and a whole range of things. So we genuinely help people who need to get out of situations with land. Um, And then on the flip side, we're finding people that can actually utilize it. So, you know, I'm speaking to people on a daily basis or should I say my team is now because we've gotten so big that we've got a team in place. Um, But sometimes I get on the phone to buyers and I was on the phone last week to a buyer who is buying acreage from us, 34 acres. And uh, she has nine kids. She's one of six herself. So she's got lots of siblings and Mm -hmm. big family, great big family. And um, they're all a little sick and tired of living in the city and dealing with, you know, violence and um, unrest and a whole range of things. So the entire family, all, I think, 30 of them uh, are moving out to a a more of a rural acreage where they're all going to build separate houses and build this family unit together. Um, and that kind of stuff I love because that's making people's lives better. Yeah. So there's a lot that you can do with land and um, and there's lots of different categories out there to explore with land as well. So it makes the business pretty exciting when when you look at different asset classes and what you can do with them. So we love land. Um, can, and can you give me a couple of examples of, of a couple of deals you've recently done? I mean, what what you paid for? Like who you bought it from, what you paid for it, who you sold it to, you know, what, what the yeah, margin yeah, was. Definitely. Just give, us, give, give our listeners some insights. It's fascinating. Yep. Yep. Sure. So uh, talking about the example that I just mentioned, this is acreage that we picked mm-hmm. up uh, 34 acres for about 130,000. 
mm-hmm. in a really uh, good place where it should have been about twice that price. Uh, it had recently been used for farming. It had been in the family for about five generations. And the current generation is like, we don't want to use this for farming anymore. We're stuck with it. You know, we don't even live near it anymore. So can you just take it off our hands? Um, so we got it for that. We've sold it for just on 200 um, so after closing costs, that will be a decent profit in there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's congrats. just going through closing at the moment. Um, we've got some other lots that are more like infill lots. So typical infill lots we will tend to get for around, depending upon the price point, because we do what's called a blind offer strategy column where we'll do a lot of research in the areas that we want deals in. We mm-hmm. know what's selling. We know what people are paying for things. We know what's closed over the last 18 months. We do quite a lot of analysis with data to find out where's the sweet spot of what we might offer for some of these properties. Mm -hmm. And we're tending to get them anywhere between, say, 30 to 60% below market. Now, the 30% might be properties that are average value between, you know, say, five and 20,000. The 60% might be properties that are 100, 150,000 and above. Mm -hmm. So, we get them for that, and then we might put them back on the market for anywhere between 70 to 80%. So you can already see there that there's a decent spread in land when you look at what you can get it for and what you resell it for. Um, and we're very transparent with our sellers as well that, you know, we will take the land off your hands, but we're the ones putting in all the work to get that land usable again, to find the right person for it, to market it, to do the due diligence, to, you know, get that marketable so that somebody can make use of it. Um, So I guess, you know, coming back to other deals that we've done, we have a a great strategy that we use um, where we've got quite a few properties of late that are just really small infill lots. But we then go to the neighbours right next door and say, hey, do you want someone to come into the, the land next door and build a McMansion or put something there that disturbs your way of living? Um, Or would you like to add this property to your existing house and make your lot bigger so you have control over your area? Um, And that's a really great strategy to use where you can get the land cheap, sell it to the neighbour, still really cheap, so everybody wins. Um, And uh, we've done quite a few deals of that lately where neighbours are wanting to protect their space. (laughs) That was my next question. Like, how do you find the seller? So obviously one strategy is offer it to the neighbors. I I love that strategy. And it's land. You're not asking them necessarily to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars like they would to buy a house. This might be 20, 30,000. What what other strategies do you have if if that one isn't viable to find sellers? To to find sellers or to find buyers? Sorry, to find somebody who will buy the land off you that that you Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so we... Once we get it under contract, we do what anybody else does um, in both land and houses when you're selling something. It Mm -hmm. goes on Zillow. We do quite a lot of due diligence first to make sure that we know what can and can't be done with the land. Then Mm -hmm. it goes on Zillow. It goes on land.com, Lands of America, Land and Farm, um, sometimes Craigslist, Facebook groups, um, you name it. It goes everywhere. The other thing that we also do is for more of the, the bigger lots that we have, the realtor that I mentioned earlier that's still a really good part of our team, sometimes mm-hmm. we'll actually joint venture with him um, on specific land that, you know, we've got some commercial land at the moment that we know has really great value in it. Um, mm. And he's partnering with us to go out to local developers and, and contractors and different types of businesses in the area um, mm. to really see if anyone can make use of it. So when we JV it, it goes on the MLS and, uh, and then obviously out to everywhere. So neighbour letters is one strategy and we tend to do neighbour letters first uh, with Mm. most properties that we have, even for commercial property, because you might have someone with a factory that actually wants to expand um, right next door. So lots of different strategies to use. But let me just reassure anybody listening, there is an abundance of sellers and buyers out there with land. Um, Most of the lots that we have, Colin, particularly at the moment, we literally put them on the market. And if they're a good lot at a good price, they're gone within a week. No kidding. I was going about to ask you, what's the whole period? Because I, I, like you, I've seen how long land can sit on the MLS, even if it seems to be priced, it can sit there literally for six, nine, 12 months because nobody's looking for buyers. They're just lifting it on the MLS yeah. and nobody's seeing it. Obviously a house, you will get offers on a house these days, but land, not so much. So what, what is your whole period then? It seems to be pretty, pretty low these days. Pretty low. Yeah, inventory is uh, walking out the door at the moment. 
Um, wow. But it, it goes through cycles. So, you know, mm. it, we, we see a trend in our buyer's market as well where um, a couple of months ago, I guess, it, I really started to see this shift with people wanting to buy a more acreage and get out of the, the city areas and go out more into, you know, where there's more space for their children to run around and where they might yeah. feel safer. So you start to see different trends in land um, with what people want to do. And I guess the other strategy to keep in mind as to why we've been able to move some of our properties so quickly is after four years, we've built up quite a buyer's list um, mm -hmm. and we've also built up quite a um, an analytical view, if you like, when we look at our, our CRM and all the, the deals that we've done of where our deals that are in high demand are moving fast. Um, and where we've got a good buyer network for those. And so we always remarket to those areas knowing that we've got a buyer network too. So one of the other strategies, I mentioned that we advertise it everywhere and do neighbour letters. One of our other strategies is just, just to go out to our existing buyers list, which is now quite big, mm -hmm. and say, hey, folks, we've got another property in the areas that you were looking at before, You know, especially if they were a buyer who missed out on a property because they didn't get an offer in fast enough. Ah, okay. Here's another property to have a look at. And, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of buyers that are still actively looking in the areas that we market. So that also helps too. That's brilliant. No, I love it that you can buy for 40, 50 cents on the dollar and sell it at, you know, 70, 80 cents on a dollar. That even leaves room, I guess, for other investors to buy it off you and they in turn can sell it on if they don't mind holding yeah. it a little longer. Yep, in, in some of the areas, particularly, I, I guess, with some of our commercial lots too, um, there's often a lot of people that will buy and hold because they know that there's a lot of development happening in that area or the, the local county. They know that there's a lot of investment going into things like infrastructure. So it's like, hmm, all the signs are there that this area is about to maybe get bigger. Um, so a lot of them will buy and hold and wait for all the development to happen around them and then they're sitting on a gold mine. So now, there's loads of different strategies out there that people think about, and I'm amazed at how creative you can get with land. <laughs> it, I mean, yeah, I have no idea. I mean, I guess there's, I mean, I, I know obviously there's a, so many people flipping houses these days and buying whole people, and you have the big corporate guys coming in and buying thousands of units, and you have wholesalers all over the place. It's a very competitive space. I mean, what's it like in, in land? How competitive is it? Yeah, look, it is it is reasonably competitive, which is why um, we built out our own marketing system to improve that competitiveness. Because what we were noticing is, you know, there's some big um, educators, if you like, out there teaching people how to flip land or wholesale or do land investing, whatever you want to call it, because it's all of those things. Sure. So we know we're noticing early on, Colin, that because of the way that a lot of people teach how to do land investing that means that a lot of people out there trying to get sellers are all starting to look and sound the same. Um, and for us, in a, <laughs> you know that problem, right? <laughs> yeah. For us, when it's in a competitive space, uh, it's all then became around, well, how do you differentiate? And um, so, you know, we were looking, first of all, at our, how we make our business really efficient and how we drive efficiency. But at the same time, we were sitting back and going, well, if we're looking and sounding like everybody else out there, how are we going to stand out? So, um, so I guess the first thing is to, to make sure that you're doing your research to see how many wholesalers are in the areas that you're in. Now, a lot of people go, you can't do that. We're like, sure you can. You just download and, and have a look at the data and check the last 18 months of sales and, and have a look at what the, the average values have been and what things are selling for. And you'll very quickly start to see uh, if there's a pattern of a whole bunch of properties selling at or above market value, and if there's ones that are selling at like, you know, 50% below market value and, and you'll see the price points and you'll be like, yep, there's a whole bunch of wholesalers in that area. Um, or just literally jumping onto to Zillow and having a look at what's for sale in that area too. So making sure that you're not in an area that is overly saturated or overly popularized. I think mm -hmm. that's the main thing. Um, but the second thing is is also standing out with your marketing. Right. So with land, just, just like trying to find off-market houses, we do mailings direct to the seller to say, hey, if you're sitting on a piece of land that you no longer want, come and chat to us. We'd love to, to talk to you about an offer or if it's an area that we know well, here's an offer attached, have a look at the numbers and let us know. 
So a couple of things that we've also done then, Colin, to make sure that we stand out is our letter and our offer. We like to make sure that it's different to what other people are sending out. So okay. standing out, first of all, is one thing. And we do that not just by the content of what's in the letter, but what we're offering the seller and how we're adding bonuses to the seller that might help them with their situation as well. We then make sure, and I'm sort of jumping into another part of our business here that we'll, we'll end up getting to later, uh-huh. but we also want to make sure that the seller can experience dealing with us in a number of different ways. So having really good landing pages, sales pages, websites, online ads, ways that they can email us, ways that they can get in touch with us online, ways that they can call us, a whole raft of different things as to how they can interact with us. Um, mm. Because for me, I think as well, what I'm noticing, Colin, and, and you might be noticing this too, you know, we spoke before about the the demographic that we are and, and the Gen Y that we are. I'm <laughs> seeing a lot of people now that are our age, if not younger, that have inherited land or houses. And mm. they're of a, a generation that they want to be able to deal with us online. They want to be able to SMS us and talk and do a whole range of different things. So Mm -hmm. having the customer experience in mind is something that we've gotten really good at. Um, And that's also helped us to get more deals. I I love it. And it's, yeah, you're, you're using a system that a lot of, you know, wholesalers have been using for years and that they're sending out thousands of letters. But obviously what a lot of people do is they just put their own phone number and then their phone rings 30 times in, in two days and they're, not able to return half the calls or they don't have the data in front of them, but you seem to have done a, an unbelievable job in combining the the kind of real estate side of things with technology and, and marketing. And it sounds like you've got a, like a, a system and a bunch of call center people that are instantly getting the right information and they know exactly what yep. to say to incoming calls and you are not yeah. personally dealing with it until you're literally negotiating the final few thousand dollars or something. Perfectly said, Colin. I think, you know, outside of the way that we've built our marketing acquisition system, um, we've also had a real focus. And I think this is where Matt's uh, experience in, you know, global transition transformation with technology. uh, We've really looked at what's our system that supports what we're trying to do. And if I can kind of touch base on that for a second, because I think this is really important for people listening who are maybe just starting out. One of the things when we started out was we took on board all the systems and processes that we were taught, but a lot of them are are relatively short visioned. And what I mean by that is they talk about get your deal and, you know, get it under contract and get it done, which is great. And that's where people should start. But at what point in business do you start to think, well, where do we want our business to be in five years time, 10 years time, 15 years time? And how do we think through the lens of being bigger than what we are today? So we really sat back and thought, If we want our business in even five years' time to be self-sufficient, have a consistent pipeline, have people taking calls for us, have a system that actually manages all of our deals for us seamlessly through all the pipelines, being a a seller's pipeline, a buyer's pipeline, the closing pipeline, if we want that to run for us so that we're not the ones in there having to do everything every day, let's do that now and think about the future. Um, So we've really set up a whole bunch of things around our systems and processes to support the way that we want to do business. And I think that's probably, I'll say this with respect to all of the educators out there, there are some fantastic educators out there that teach people how to do fix and flip business, land wholesaling, investing, a whole range of different things. Yep. But a lot of them don't teach you how to run a business around it. They teach you how to do the deal but not necessarily how to run a business. So our focus was more on, well, how do we get efficient at running a business in this mm-hmm. stuff? Um, and we've really come a long way there, which has been really exciting too. I love it. I mean, and I can certainly see how you can, you know, people can do a course or do their own research and, and they buy a couple of deals and then it's, okay, let me see if I can buy three deals next quarter and then four deals after that. But eventually you're going to be like, okay, I'm, I'm a bit too busy now. And you just have no way of thinking, well, how do I go from two deals a month to 20 deals a month. That's just totally alien concept, it, but it sounds like you've, you've started that way. We, we did. And, and we really started to look at that through the lens of positive problems because we even have a lot of customers that, that come to us that use our marketing acquisition system. And, and they say to us, I'm doing, you know, uh, three to four deals a month and I want to go to 10. We're like, that's awesome. That's great. We love that, that you've got that as a goal, but let's just time out. Have you thought about the systems and processes you'll need to support 10 deals a month? 
because mm-hmm. in their heads it doesn't sound like much. But going from two to three deals to ten is tripling your business. Yes. And um, so you've really got to think through what are the support mechanisms around that, which we offer quite a lot of consulting on to really make sure that they've thought through that, um, which is, you know, another thing I see in this industry and something that we didn't do very well early on was put a solid business plan together and really think through our numbers and really think through reverse engineering. What does that mean to run a business if we're looking at these numbers and not these numbers? Mm-hmm. So, um, so yeah, lot, lots of lessons that we've learned over that space too. So it sounds like you're not only using, you know, your own kind of in-house technology and marketing to grow your own business. It sounds like you're offering other uh, land investors access to your platform. Is that correct? The marketing platform, yes. So our our marketing platform, which is called Supercharged Offers, is okay. a done for you acquisition system um, that we've we've built to the point that we can pretty much integrate it into any CRM and and make sure that all of the basics for people's acquisition is done for them. And I guess before I launch into to Supercharged Offers, I guess can I touch on some of the things as to why businesses fail and why we ended up building it? Would that be okay, Colin? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, awesome. So I think some of the things that um, that come to mind. So you know, if we go to some of the research, I know we were looking at an article a few weeks ago by CBI Insights, which is the top ten reasons as to why small businesses fail. And this was an American article, but for me, this kind of rings true for anywhere. And it was things like, you know, not enough market need. Um, and for me, when when we're looking at real estate, as I said before, if you're in a saturated area where supply and demand is out of balance then the market's going to tell you that. Things like running out of cash, uh, not putting the right team in place, um, getting out-competed by people that are in the area before you're there, costs, pricing, um, a, a product that isn't user-friendly. And, and I touched on, you know, making sure that the customer experience is something that, that we keep in mind. Um, no business model, poor marketing. Uh, the list can go on ignoring customers and, uh, and having missed timing around your product. And it was interesting, Matt and I were sitting back and looking at this list and we're thinking all of this relates to people doing real estate investing. You see so many people out there that send their sellers to voicemail and never get back to them. You see so many people out there that don't do the appropriate research before they go into a market and then they're out-competed or mistimed. You see a lot of people out there that go and spend a fortune on courses and go and market and waste all this money because they haven't stopped to go, what's my business strategy and what's my plan? Um, so we see a lot of these happening and, and I see a lot of people out there that try and get started in this industry around real estate investing and particularly land and have a few false starts and then feel like the failures defeated them. But we like to look at failure as a lesson, which is if something didn't work, what can we put in place as a system or a process or a learning to turn that around? Um, and that's, for me, a really good mindset around business too. Because one of the things that that really holds people back when it comes to real estate investing and particularly land wholesaling and land investing is what I call the three Cs. So not yeah. only have you got all of these problems that get in the way of running a, a small business or a small to medium business, but the main things that you'll see for people doing land is number one, consistency. If you don't get your marketing consistent and you're Mm -hmm. always out there doing mailings and you're always out there in front of your customers online, very quickly your pipeline will dry up. And you see a lot of people out there that will go and get get do do some marketing, get a deal. They'll turn around over here and they'll be like, right, now I've got to get rid of the deal. Deal's done. They turn back to their pipeline and there's nothing there. Um, And so very quickly you can end up without a business because you need deals in order to kind of keep the, the business going. So mm-hmm. consistency is one problem that I see a lot in this industry. Um, the, the, the second thing for me is currency. And what I, I mean by currency is not necessarily monetary, but time. Time for me is a major currency. We've all got the mm-hmm. same 24 hours in a day, but I see a lot of people that are wasting their time or I'm not going to say wasting because I don't, a lot of people spend their time on things that they really enjoy. Sure. But you've also got to question yourself every day. Am I spending time on the right things that is making me money? Yep. Because if I'm spending time on things that is taking me away from revenue generating activities, then is that the best use of time? So for me, that currency between time and making money is is a constant struggle where people are spending time on you know, printing their own letters, um, doing their own data, 
yeah. sticking stamps on envelopes and it's like yeah come driving on, around the county in circles all day you know it, it's like there's a better use of time around things uh, and mm-hmm. the last one which is part of that that 10 list as well is competitors so as I mentioned before, Colin, if you've done the same training as everyone else and you've got a whole bunch of you marketing to the same place with the same letter, having the same website that all looks the same, you're going to have sellers that get everything and go, huh, w- which one do I take? So being able to stand out. So we really started to look at that ourselves because we were having those problems when we started our business. Mm-hmm. We weren't consistent with our pipeline. We were spending time on the things that were perhaps not the right things. Um, and we were looking like everyone else. So coming back now to supercharged offers, that's the main reason why we started building it. We we wanted to look at how we became more efficient in our own business, but equally we were really tired of trying to compete with everyone else and having the deal flow be really hit and miss. Mm-hmm. So that's why we built it. That's amazing. Yeah, and that's it's a very thoughtful way of approaching it. And I've made most of, of if not all, of those mistakes you mentioned over the years. Everybody that's another has, way. Right? Well, hey, done is better than not done. I mean, I made the mistakes instead of not making them in the first place. But I have definitely wasted a lot of time sending lots of letters and then not sending any more. Or I bought three houses in a week and I'm like, okay, I don't want any more. I'll just focus on selling them and forget to keep marketing to buy more. And I, there's a big gap between when I buy the next one. I've done a ton of different things. And you're right. Yep, if you're, if we you're, all have. <laughs> if you're a bit more self-aware of uh, like the inevitable consequences of all these actions, you you can, yeah, you can make your life a whole lot more efficient. Same with, with time. Yeah. I, you know, I've wasted a lot of time driving around in circles, doing data processing, managing you know, mail campaigns, I mean, doing due diligence on properties and public records, all sorts yeah. of stuff that I don't do anymore. But I mean, I'm glad, part of me is glad I did it so that I learned, you know, how to teach someone yeah. else to do it. But uh, part of me is thinking I, I could have got a lot smarter, a lot quicker if I... Uh, yeah. And, and I'm with you on that point that I think um, one of the things that Matt and I always say is uh, you should never outsource something unless you know how to do it yourself. Because mm. then how are you going to manage a resource or a system um, unless you really know the ins and outs of how to do something. So I'm 100% with you on that, that early on we had to get our hands dirty and get in there and know how to do things. But there mm-hmm. comes a point where you go, okay, is that best use of my time? Like time out. Um, so I, I love that that you have that same philosophy around things too. And, and you I know, do. I, I don't think we'll, none of us get to where we started. And this is something, you know, we talked about the title of this podcast being around paralysis of analysis and why people don't get started and things like that. If you're sitting there trying to start a business and you've got all these things, you know, you look at the list of 10 reasons why people fail in business. You look at the consistency, the competition, the currency stuff I talked about. There's no wonder that people go into overwhelm and go into paralysis of analysis. Yep. But then it's just picking one of the problems and working through it. And, and that's where we started is let's just pick one thing. And for us, it was, consistency and efficiency with our pipeline and that's where supercharged offers was born so yeah we, we can talk a little bit more about that if you like but um lots more to get I, through I, I, yeah I, I love the idea that that you're building a, a platform that other businesses can use that to, to, to manage their own marketing and, and their own sourcing yeah. and own selling so yeah by all means let tell us a bit more about it sure so i guess it was one of those things colin it uh, i like to call it the accidental business because we literally built out this acquisition uh, marketing platform and and pipeline um, engine, if you like, for Mm -hmm. ourselves. So we looked at, okay, what do we want to do better? And and having that consistency of acquisition was where we started because without acquisitions done properly, you don't have a business, let's face Mm -hmm. it. Um, So we we built it for ourselves and then we showed it to a few friends in our inner circle and they were like, can you do that for us as well? (laughs) So we thought, oh, maybe we're onto something here. Mm -hmm. So supercharged offers is is based upon what we call the five Ds, which incorporated into the system itself is all of your data done for you, um, all of your direct mail, all of the digital integration, which for me, digital integration is your sales pages, your landing pages, your online conversion tools, your email automation, Mm-hmm. Facebook and Google ads, all of the online stuff that, you know, the, the younger generation might prefer. Um, yep. A dashboard that actually shows you all of your marketing results down to each individual mail piece and where it's gone and has it been delivered. Um, and then everything done for you. So that's our five Ds. For me, the done for you bit is the critical bit here because most of our supercharged offers customers now are saving on average between 10 to 15 hours a week 
a week <laughs> because a they're not they're not having to do downloading a list, cleansing their list, looking at their data, getting a VA to go and cleanse their data for them. Yeah, they're yeah. not doing mail merging. They're not dealing with a mail house and getting everything done. They're not printing themselves. So, you know, we're doing all of that for them. And um, we, we really pride ourselves on the fact that not only have we built a great system, but we genuinely love helping people to build their own businesses. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the main thing that that's driving us uh, with supercharged offers as well, because so many people come to us and they're like, ah, you know, I really want to do more in this business, but I don't have enough resources and it's just me or I've only got me and one person. And the question that I often ask them is, okay, well, if you and your team member or how many you've got, if you were to purely focus your time on closing those acquisitions, taking the phone calls, nurturing your leads and doing from that part of the business on, would mm-hmm. that make a difference? And the resounding answer is always yes. Yeah. Um so, so that's what we do is we, we aim to get the phone ringing and, and make sure that all of that marketing and that acquisition is done for you so you can focus on the things that really matter. Now, acquisitions does matter, but yes. it's definitely something that you can outsource and have done for you. I love it. So are, are your, yeah. your clients for supercharged offers mostly other land flippers in the US that, that you've kind of networked with over the years? Or yeah, are you you're expanding so- that beyond land? We, we, we can pretty much do it for any asset class, uh, Colin. So at the moment, uh, we have quite a few people using it who are land wholesalers or land flippers. We have uh, a couple of people using it for multifamily. Uh, we've got single family homes, so people that are fix and flippers. We've got people using it that have a mobile home business. And we've now got somebody using it for self-storage as an asset class. So each wow. of those asset classes has had a custom-built marketing strategy, content plan, design plan, um, you know, full integration into their, their seller market and what it is that they want to get for their deals. Uh, and it's all been done for them. So we've got some pretty excited customers out there. And the thing that we like to call it, you know, we're about to launch some more marketing for supercharged offers ourselves. And we, we're looking at some fancy ways of, of how do we kind of get people clued on to what this is? And we're calling it the Create Your Competitor Crusher Marketing Challenge. <laughs> um, because it's about how you okay. stand out from others and how to take your business from okay to oh wow. And the thing we like about the okay to oh wow is we have people coming to us that have built their own landing page through the people that they learned how to do it from. Yep. And we look at it and, and they go, oh, what do you think? And we're like, yeah, it's, it's okay. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. really it's, it's not performing for them. It's just yep. con- content on a page. No one's going to the page. No one's converting. You look at the page and you go, oh, yeah, it doesn't look great. Uh, yeah. So we're really looking at, well, how do we take it from basic to like when they finally get to the final product? And most of our customers have this reaction. Just mm-hmm. had a, one today that I showed him his design and he's like, that's amazing. I would never have thought to do that. So with Supercharged Offers, we've got uh, a team of nine uh, in place, anything from content writers to um, researchers. Uh, We've got a design team. We've got a development team. We've got a salesperson. We've got an onboarding manager. So so we have a team in place that really ensures a a good customer experience from, you know, going from okay to, oh, wow. Oh, wow. Wow. Uh, It sounds like you're going to be just as busy with growing supercharged offers as you are growing your own land acquisition business. We will and we are. (laughs) That's amazing. No, and, and good luck with that. Sounds like a fantastic service and I think that's a total win-win for for you it could be a t- terrific business for you and Matt and I, I can see how that could help a lot of people scale up their own real estate businesses whether they're yeah. flipping land or like you say doing single family homes or looking for mobile homes or, or whatever it might be it's just a better way of targeting those motivated buyers and then finding the sellers afterwards without killing absolutely. yourself absolutely yep couldn't I agree more well, that's super useful. Thanks so much for sharing. That's an incredible story that you're doing all this from from Melbourne, and it just goes to show, you know, how there's no excuse not to not to take that plunge, not not to back yourself uh, to start. I agree, Colin. Yeah, and look, you know, we didn't start perfectly. We made some mistakes early on. Um, super quickly, our first mailing that we ever sent, we uh, had a typo on the phone number and had the wrong phone number go out, and it went to some poor woman who thought we stole her oh, identity. No. Uh, and we ended up doing a deal with her. She, funnily enough, she worked as a, as a salesperson. So she finally got in touch with us and she's like, did you guys steal my identity? <laughs> and we're like, oh, 
is that why we're not getting calls? And um, so she ended up taking all of our calls for us and we paid her a commission for anything that she sent wow. over. So, you know, it just goes to show that, you know, you can make mistakes in this business and still recover from it and it's not about getting it perfect. And um, if I can offer some final advice for anyone listening to that, is that okay, Colin? Yeah. I guess that the thing is for anyone starting out in this business is to remember that we all started at the same place, even the ones out there that you see that are, They've got multi-million dollar land wholesaling businesses. They're doing deals all over the place. And, you know, you might look at them and go, oh, that's amazing. But they all started in the same place that that anybody listening is, where they were learning this for the first time. So, Mm -hmm. you know, all of us started at the same place and we've all learned the same mistakes and successes and things. So for anybody out there listening, just start by mapping mapping out your goals and mapping out a solid business plan. Um, I see a lot of people out there that don't do that. Um, because part of a solid business plan should be your marketing plan and, and what you're looking from a, from an acquisition perspective. Mm-hmm. Start by looking at things like best use of time, um, learning how to do all the basics, sure, but then what's the best use of your time to nurture your seller relationships and, and convert more deals? Because at the end of the day, this is a relationship business, not a real estate business um, in my mind. It's a relationship and a marketing business. And if you do get paralysis of analysis, just push pause, go back to your business plan and just look at what's my next one to four weeks and just do that. Because Mm -hmm. every time you get a a new thing happen, you'll just move on naturally to the next stage. Uh, And the other thing is, don't forget to stop and pause every now and then, celebrate the wins, because there are a lot of things to to be thankful for and, um, you know, look at as a chance to grow. And and if there is a failure, stop and celebrate that too, because that's a chance to kind of look at how you do things better. It's true. People dwell on the failures too much and and take the successes for granted. And I remember in the early days, we we celebrated our early successes. We made $3,000, we made $5,000 and it was like high fives. Let's go for a fancy dinner. But later (laughs) on when you're making tens of thousands a month and you're like, yeah, whatever. It's what we're supposed to be doing, but I got this thing wrong. And you just kind of focus on the bad thing. And it's, you know, it's not the right way to do it. I mean, I get it, but I think that the good attitude, uh, the networking, and above all, just develop some resilience and you can mm. do anything with enough patience, really. Yep. Totally Brilliant. agree. Great advice. Totally agree. Um, great advice out there. Great story as well. I love it. And I'm, I'm going to keep an eye at it and see how you do. It's going to get exciting. I think you've an ex- very exciting year ahead of you. So how can, <laughs> how can people reach out to you, Lisa, if they want to find yeah, out a bit thanks, more? Yeah, thanks, Colin. And, and just a, a personal thank you to you for the opportunity to, to share our story today. I, I get super excited when people ask me on podcasts because <laughs> I think we are living proof that if you can't do this, if you can do this from Australia, you can do it from anywhere. And if you're in the United States, even easier. Um, so, uh, so what people can do is I, I've touched a little bit today on how to have a good business plan and, and in particular a marketing plan. They can go onto our website, so which is uh, superchargedoffers.com. So one word, superchargedoffers.com. Right. And we have on there what's called a No More Excuses Business Growth Plan. Uh, it's free. They can download it and it takes them through everything to map out their business, their acquisition plan what they want to do and how they want to do it. And it's a great place to get started because I think a lot of people, particularly if they're in overwhelm, get out pen and paper and it's like writer's block. Okay, where do I start? So at least if they download this free guide and this free plan, they can get started. Uh, And a lot of people that have done it find it really useful. Otherwise, they can call myself or our team. Our number is 888-538-5478. Seven, eight, and our team would be happy to take their call and direct them either to our sales team or to me. Um, and lastly, I'm happy for people to email me direct. So it's Alicia, which is spelt A-L-I-C-I-A at superchargedoffers.com. Perfect. I will put all that on the show notes, Alicia. And thanks again for joining us and sharing your story. Wonderful. Thank you, Colin. I appreciate it. No worries. You take care. You too. There you go, folks. That was Alicia Jarrett in show number 35. And uh, you got to take your hat off to her and her partner, Matt, for for building such an interesting business, flipping land uh, in Florida from Australia and building a platform, a marketing and technology platform that enables other land flippers and not just land flippers, but house flippers 
uh, to do the same thing. Um, fascinating way of doing things and just goes to show how globalized the world economy has become. I mean, I, you know, I lived in Madrid, Spain for many years while I was investing in the Florida market and I had business partners and teams of people here on the ground. But that trend has just accelerated tremendously. And um, like you say, if you, you can build a machine, you can take access to a marketing machine that would enable anybody to build a land flipping business, a property flipping business, no matter where in the world you live. I mean, just because you might live in an expensive market, maybe the Bay Area, for example, doesn't mean you can't start buying and selling houses in Kansas or Florida or or wherever. Um, you know, if you can do it from Australia, you can you can certainly do it from anywhere in the U.S. So, uh, you know, fair play to Alicia and Matt for doing that. It's quite inspirational and a lot of lessons in there about just persevering and keep going and, and always tweaking and not being afraid of making mistakes and failing and learning from them and, and always moving forward, always figuring things out, always working with new and interesting people. There's a lot of really good stuff in there that, that I totally uh, agree with and I, I hope you will too. And uh, yeah, I mean, just even on its own, land flipping is, is a fascinating business. I mean, I've, as a guy who's, you know, uh, renovated and sold, you know, three or 400 houses, uh, the idea of just buying and selling a piece of land, <laughs> doing nothing to it, is quite appealing. It removes an awful lot of complexity with dealing with, with uh, construction crews and contractors and roofs and kitchens and cabinets and appliances and bathrooms and plumbing and septic systems and fences and neighbors. And it's, yeah, it's, it's appealing. Um, I'm checking that out. Uh, so, you know, watch this space. I'm, I'm checking that out. And uh, but aside from that, hope you got something useful out of this. Uh, if you enjoyed it, please do give it a rating or a review on your podcast app. And even better, uh, if you can find this episode on your on my social media, Colin Investment or Colin G. Murphy, and you can share it with your own audiences. I'd really appreciate that, too. Uh, but other than that, I'm kind of signing out here for day for today. I will be back very soon for show number 36. But until then, this is Colin G. Murphy signing out. Take care, guys. Bye bye. Thank you.